In our reports, we highlight um, different levels of impact with respect to class size reduction, greater ease of classroom management, strengthening personal relationships with students, and varying instructional methods. I was wondering if some of you could please speak to um, how you've been able to leverage class size reduction to make changes in your classroom and have an impact on your students. I think as an administrator on the campus, one of the things that I've really noticed is the relationships within the classroom. And it's just not on that one-to-one -one of knowing the students and knowing their story, but it's understanding you know, who is the student and how are, they, you know, best, um, how are their needs best suited in the classroom. Really understanding their needs and being able to provide them with that, that intervention. You know, we always talk about how we want to implement an RTI system within our schools, but the magic happens within the classroom. And class size reduction has really allowed that to happen. Whereas before, you know, 35 students, if you tell a fifth grade teacher, oh, we need to do guided reading in the classroom, and they'd be like, uh-huh, <laughs> how is that gonna happen? You know, you have to work with four or five students. What are the other kids gonna be doing? And the nightmare that sometimes that can create. But with class size reduction, it's allowed our teachers not only that capability to really know their kids, really know exactly where they are, where are those, um, those gaps in their learning, but to be able to implement literacy centers, you know, guided reading, small groups for writing, and just really understanding their students as a whole. And that's been very, very powerful because not only do our students feel that, wow, my teacher really cares about me, they know about me. When we have our SST meetings, it's amazing the amount of information that teachers can share with us. You know, it's not just, oh, they have a 52% average in math. No, it's like, oh, I noticed that, you know, they have trouble with, you know, multiple, you know, multisyllabic words. You know, they're getting stuck, you know, in this area of comprehension. It's like that deep information is what's been really powerful in the classroom and has allowed us to really um, be successful with our students. Um, having the class size smaller has, um, like Abby said, has allowed the teachers to, um, to do guided reading a lot more often. And I can tell that when I meet with my students, um, they really enjoy that small group time. You know, we're, we're able to get to know the students better. Um, sometimes in between um, stories or questions, comprehension questions that I may ask them, they, um, they make a connection and they bring up something that happened in their home, something that I wouldn't normally um, have known otherwise if I hadn't had that small group and if that student didn't have that opportunity to have that filter removed. That, that student has been able to speak to me. Um, there are days where uh, we have to skip it and the students are very disappointed that we don't get to meet, they don't get to meet with me. And I am disappointed as well because I really do enjoy the guided reading. I really enjoy getting to know my students. And the, having the class size smaller has really given me that opportunity and I am enjoying it. Uh, the impact of class, uh, class size reduction um, it's like a, a rhetorical question, right? I, well, but seven minutes, that's how much it is. The difference between 30 and 20 students. Seven extra, seven, seven extra minutes that you, I also calculated that. <laughs> that's how much time you end up on your hands every day. And so if you have it, uh, you know, times five, that's 35, well, 35 minutes per week, right? What do you do with that extra time? So in my case as a teacher, probably I would text the parent to you know, compliment on their kid's homework or uh, send a picture of their homework, um, uh, you know, and uh, talk to that parent. Talk to the kid, you know, and uh, how about teaching them? <laughs> you know, so it is, it is a no-brainer. Uh. I think with the class size reduction, um, it really helps us as teachers to work and focus on the kids that need the extra help, but because th for different reasons, they need the extra help because they're lower and you know they're in remedial level, and we need to use intervention. But you also get to target the kids that are excelling, and you keep pushing them to a higher level to not stop just where like the book says, oh, you can stop here. It's getting to the extra projects that you don't ever really have time for. So having the smaller classes, it really makes a difference as, as a whole rainbow. It covers everybody. Working with students who are reading two um, um, levels below grade level, 
class size rejection really helped because it really helps me to focus and target those students who are just struggling readers and just working with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis or small groups can really um, help um, them um, gain in comprehension and also with um, vocabulary. So um, working with students um, in a smaller group setting has really helped. I see um, that my students are slowly but gradually I see little steps in how they are um, mastering their um, standards in, in language arts. Hargraves and Fullen in their book, Professional Capital, right? Successful, successful and sustainable improvement can only, can never be done to or even for teachers. It can only ever be achieved by and with them. Uh, many teachers in our study said that it can be difficult to get the autonomy needed to affect change. How have teachers at your school been able to go about bringing change? Well, at, um, at our school, we have a really good staff that has been dedicated, um, and every teacher believes that the students can achieve and be successful. And I think that um, that's one important key um, that our student, I mean, I'm sorry, that our teachers have had is really being committed and um, participating and knowing that we're all in it together. They, um, we have, uh, we have uh, done uh, learning walks where we wanted to see what other classrooms are doing and um, we hold each other accountable and we collaborate. So just really coming together and believing that we can do it it's, uh, it's been a big step. I think the whole um, negative stigma of program improvement, being the only school within our district, I think that was unity within itself. Having um, known that, oh my goodness, you know, we're always looked at that school, there was already that unity there. You have, I mean, Evergreen has a group of dedicated teachers who meet all the, you know, the characteristics that you were sharing, that they're innovative and they're willing, they wanted that change. But you know, as the administrator coming in, you also know, well, you can't come in here and turn it upside down. You know, that's not what teachers want because a lot of the things that they were implementing were great things. But the focus was maybe off in different areas. So coming in and looking to see, okay, let's take a look at our data together. What do we have and what can we do together to move on and to be successful? So that was one of the things that when we came together and realized we're gonna do this together, I mean, we came up with our own credo, our own statement, that every time we start a staff meeting, we say it together because it's almost like our unity chant, saying that this is why we're here. You know, we're not here for our individual you know, accomplishments. It's because we want our, our kids to be successful and be ready for hopefully college one day. But um, I think that unity that we have you know, and it's, it's, it's hard to instill, especially because, you know, with all of the layoffs this last year, we lost eight staff members last year to pink slips. So inheriting teachers from other schools who had no clue, they were coming from non-Title I schools, you know, and to come into our culture that was already on this, you know, this train of success, you know, trying to get them in and quickly, let's get them ready. Let's try to, you know, and our, and our teachers are remarkable because they've collaborated with them. They've been supportive and really created this network system that, you know what, unless we work together, unless we trust one another, it's not gonna be able to be possible. But, you know, within those, those changes, it's also been input. You know, I couldn't go in there and say, we're only gonna do this. You know, our teachers, they, they're the experts in the classroom. You know, I can't go in there and say, you're gonna teach this and this and that, okay? But I can create successful structures for them. And that's what I did. I created a structure where they can collaborate and have that time. Because if you ask any teacher, what would be helpful to you? Time, time to meet together, time to plan, time to really put these strategies that we talk about into practice and analyze and to see how they helped us. Our principal came into our school six years ago when Quia was starting and she met with every single teacher and with all of us. And her goal was to get us sort of like, not on the same page, but to see what we needed to do. And so we started working together, um, meeting, but at the same time she was allowing us to come up with what it is that we needed. She just said this is the structure that we have to follow and we have to get there. I can tell you that our school, we, we have some really good teachers, I really do feel that, but they had doors closed. Don't come and see me, I don't want you in my room, I don't wanna show anybody anything. Very individualistic. 
and that was what changed six years ago, the open door policy. Come and see me, I will teach you, I do this, oh, let me share this with you, and that changed the culture at our school, where now it's an open door policy. We have people from other schools coming to us, and everybody is just sharing um, at our meetings also. If something's working for kinder, guess what? Somebody in fifth grade heard it, and now they're gonna try something similar too. Uh, you heard it, uh, transparency. Uh, my school was no different than the cases uh, here described. Initially, it was really hard for us, for teachers, to let other teachers know how we're doing and how we're performing. But once we became transparent and open about what works for us and what doesn't, then we were able to collaborate and uh, tackle our problems. So that's very important. I think that, that and, and, and you couple that to teachers willing to actually, actually teach teachers, you know, putting themselves out there and availing uh, themselves to their colleagues and uh, preparing for uh, all of that and having their doors open, as somebody else said here. That is empowering. I think usually teachers find the word change to be uninviting. Um, at Columbia, through the years, we have seen a lot of um, changes in our school year with new teachers coming in, new administrators taking over, or new school procedures and new policies. But the key to changing the school climate for Columbia for the better is to create a campus where we have collaboration and to work together to put students and instruction first. Uh, a lot has been said today about uh, the structures that have been put that have been put in place to allow meaningful collaboration to occur. Can some of you talk about how um, collaborating with your colleagues has changed what you do specifically in the classroom? How has it helped you? Um, for me, uh, the collaborating part is um, one of my favorites is because it, it gives me a strong sense of support. Um, I really do feel supported with my colleagues. I feel that we trust each other. I feel that I can share what didn't work in the classroom for me. And um, they're not gonna turn around and say, oh, uh, what are you teaching? Or where did you get your education from? <laughs> because uh, sometimes it doesn't always work like the, in the classroom the way you think it's gonna work. And uh, I think the collaborating part is, like I said, one of my favorites. Um, in, and then also the other teachers in, in the grade level, they get to share what worked for them, what didn't work for them, or sometimes they struggle with the same things that I'm struggling with. Um, and we brainstorm what could happen, you know? Some, we Google some uh, strategies and we pull over, we pull out some, um, some of the binders of the trainings that we've gone to and we think, well, remember when we went to see uh, Nancy Fetzer or remember when we had this training or, you know, so it really does uh, pull us closer together. Um, yeah, it reinforces the consistency um, where we know we're doing the same thing, we're, we know we're not alone. Um, and I, I used to feel when I first started teaching, I used to feel like I'm right next door to the teacher, but I feel like I'm so alone even though I have the 20 students in my class. But now I don't feel that with the collaborating piece of it. I feel like, oh, okay, you know, we're in this together. Um, they struggle with the same things, and um, this is working for her, and I'm gonna try it out, and if it doesn't work for me, then I'll try something different. In my language arts team, um, we usually collaborate um, two or three times a month, and we plan together, and we all teach the same standard at the same time with the same common assessments. Um, with this, um, students know what to expect no matter what classroom they go um, into, and it prevents our middle school students from choosing who, which class they want to be in. Um, collaboration also becomes a true measure because we get to go ahead and have a conversation about um, our best practices, and the number one question that always comes up at our grade level meeting will be, did it work for you, or how do your students do? So. Um, our language arts team, our district benchmark, we usually um, show consistent huge gains, and we're usually the top school in our district because of collaboration. So usually I really look forward um, having this time with my colleagues because we're just learning from each other and um, to become better teachers and in turn our students do win. You know this is another rhetorical question, right? <laughs> How does collaboration help? <laughs> 
It didn't help me shorten my Friday's uh, lunchtime because that's when my team decided to meet and discuss the data. And uh, of course it does, uh, it helps a lot. Um, it validates your skills, you know, as your teacher. As a teacher, you feel like, oh, I have some value here, you know? I can do something. And, and uh, you know, I, I always need to illustrate my case. I, I, I have that, I always feel that I have to teach to everyone. <laughs> so let's take, for instance, um, I, I'm just going to stick to Google Docs, okay? So I taught one of my colleagues how to use it and how to have his students collaborate around it. And then he took it to the, his classroom. Being that he has you know, a brilliant mind, he um, uh, put links. So he's, he's ha he has a writing prompt when he, where he wants to elicit the best thinking from the kids. He wants to engage them. So he took a poll in the class. Most kids were into baseball. So he went into YouTube, uh, hunt down a, a, you know, a very, I guess a video that was on a, a referee call on the last Saturday game or something like that. So he put a link there and, and guess what? Kids were, of course, you know, they were arguing about like, you know, trying, and that's high level thinking. That's what we're going for, right? where you go and you, you have to argument your case. You know, you have to have evidence. W why do you feel like that that referee? And then how about communicating that in writing? That's not easy. So now there's more admiration for me toward that teacher. I feel like I have to go now and bug him for ideas, you know? That's collaboration. Another <laughs> rhetorical question. <laughs> If I could address it, and I guess as the administrator, because I go in there with different eyes. Um, when I first began and we created the structure of collaboration for teachers to meet on a weekly basis, um, you know, what Gloria said was right. You know, you could be on the same grade level, but there were some that would, you know, still holding on, didn't want to share those wonderful lessons. But it's been wonderful to see just the transformation where now, you know, teachers, I mean, it's not only student progress that we're seeing, but it's also the teacher leadership because within their own grade levels, creating their own agenda, saying, hey, you know what, you're good with this, why don't you create this, you know, the delegation. I mean, you see the leaders within your own teams, you know, and some people who are maybe were more quiet are now, you know, they're sharing their strategies, they're offering up their classrooms, like, you know what, I'm gonna be doing this next week, if you're not too sure, you know, let's get somebody to cover your class so you can come in and, you know, observe me do this lesson. So that's been the, the powerful, you know, nest of that I've seen within the collaboration at our school, not only for our teachers, for our students, but you know, within themselves, you know, sometimes they may not be knowing it, but they're providing their own you know, staff development. I've seen teachers sometimes go up there and like, oh, I forgot how you do, you know, how do you do that GLAD strategy? Break out the butcher paper and they start, you know, this is how I would do it. And it's wonderful to see that because it is powerful and you know, and having that set time, that is their sacred time. You know, when they, when they were talking about how it develops its own identity, and it's true, you know, we were laughing there because we call ours TCB, you know, like Elvis taking care of business. <laughs> that is our time. That's our time to take care of business. So, yeah, it definitely has done just immense things at our school. I mean, I add to everything that they've said. Um, a big thing at our school is we don't steal, we borrow. So we're always constantly sharing. Um, we collaborate, we have two staff meetings a month and then two grade level meetings. But at our school we have what they, our principal called the wild card days where we have one per trimester and the grade level is all pulled out and they get subs for their classrooms and they meet all day. And that's just a planning day for just for that trimester alone. And it happens again second trimester and then third trimester. So it's the planning, it's the little things that you never get to, it's the tests that we're missing something. Um, it's, you know, you're getting the data, you're trying new um, websites, like the big thing at our school right now, it's uh, mybigcampus.com. That's the, that's the greatest, latest thing that everybody's into. So it's just always sharing, but like I said, we don't steal, we just borrow. 
Uh, my next question is about leadership, and Yabi touched upon a little bit of it. What effect has leadership had in helping changes in classroom take place, both teacher and administrative leadership? Well, I think with anything, um, nobody wants the being told, this is what you're going to do. So, you know, first of all, you have to have trust in your teachers. And that's one of the things that I can say about my staff is that they are very talented, they are dedicated, and I'm sure the whole panel will agree with their teachers as well. I mean, this doesn't happen overnight. This success happens because we're all on the same page. We all truly believe that our students can learn. But with that, you know, you have to be able to provide that support net. You know, like I had talked about before, time, whether it's that weekly collaboration that they have their two hours that I meet with them every other week. The other two weeks are for them to plan. You know, when they need a planning day, you know what, you know, we have to really update our, our matrix that we have. Can we have planning day? Yes. Because that's what they need. If they're, if they're coming to you, it's because they really need it. So, you know, giving them that planning time. We need more resources. You know, our technology is having in issues. What can we do? You know, those little things and, and really just providing that, that trust in them. You know, at the beginning of the year, okay, take a look at your data. What do you think, you know, how do you need to change your matrix? And believing them, because they are the experts in their classroom. You know, and they, like I said, that trust that I have in them, I know that they're implementing that in their classroom. Uh, like Gabby stated, she does trust us to uh, make those decisions uh, when we, um, and, and she has provided substantial support um, by allowing us to go to trainings that we need refresher courses on, um, giving us that release time to plan, and we are held accountable for those planning days because she requires an agenda from us before we go before we take our planning day. We need to have a plan before we plan. What are you going to plan for? <laughs> so we need to know, and that's part of the accountability that uh, we're being uh, held up to. Um, so that's uh, that's been. Um, that's been very successful, and again, um, that comes from having uh, a group of teachers that are willing to, and they're dedicated and committed to providing all that. Uh, Top-down leadership, you know, it's, I don't know where it works. Uh, nobody likes totalitarianism. But um, at our school, uh, you know, uh, if you think about our principal, and he will tell you, I hired you because I know you can do your job. You know, I'm not gonna be, you know, checking on you, eavesdropping or whatnot. You know, he sees you uh, as an equal. And uh, uh, what happens when you have that kind of environment? Well, teachers go and create things. They are willing to experiment. You know, last year, uh, Gate Academy was created at our school that serves about 150 uh, students, you know? So we're talking about the students who, you know, usually don't get served. And they do, uh, they deserve to be served. Um, well, teachers need to, sometimes they need to be bold. They, they need to be courageous, you know? They need to say, okay, I wanna be the chairperson in my grade level. You know, I'm going to meet here, and this is the agenda. You better shoot that agenda one night before, you know, a day before, so people know what's on their plate next day, right? And I think that that's that probably, you know, Kui played a major factor. You know, I've been at the, at the same school before Kui, and, and today it's a total uh, t a different place, you know? Um, so, Teachers experiment, and I think that uh, among us teachers, we all have different talents. We all do, you know. And so, some teachers feel like, okay, I need, a, I want to create. I'm a creator type of person. I'm going to create this academy. It's going to serve this many students. Bring engineers from uh, Sac State, all the local colleges here. Have them, uh, you know, interact with the students. That has a major impact. Then the students want to become engineers, you know? Unlike uh, anything that we have in our neighborhood. Not, not the most part, but you know, there's the apartment complex across, across our street that, thank God, got closed. Um, then there are teachers who are into arts. We all have talents, you know, the visual and performing arts. It's also being brought to our schools. Last week I was uh, 
you know, I was out in the classroom and uh, there was a music teacher who brought instruments from all over the world, you know? Up, up until last week, kids didn't know the three groups of instruments, let alone touch one of them. So that connects to the geography, that, conne that connects to the ancient civilizations, if you want, it connects to anything. So if you let the teachers do what their intuition tells them sh they should do, you know, uh, you, you will see uh, great things uh, coming uh, into fruition, you know? Uh, I think in our school, our principal, uh, I don't know if it was him, I don't want to credit everything to our principal <laughs> here, just because he's here. But uh, <laughs> the, the vision, you know, with the clear money, we could have uh, gone ahead and bought more uh, support staff, you know, hired more teachers. And I know I'm kind of talking against <laughs> hiring teachers, that's bad. But look, we decided to go for technology, you know, we decided to invest in uh, 50 computers, one uh, computer lab, about 60 laptops moving lab, and then uh, smart boards in every classroom. It's beautiful, you know, you wanna discuss the data, how about you pull it right here, you, you have it in your lunch, here it is, it's, uh, you know, the smart board, you're interacting with the data. You click on it, you see the names of the students who didn't perform well in X, Y qu question. So that takes vision, right? And so he, I, I think I did answer that question here. One thing I left out, um, and, and I, fr I can't believe I, I did forget it, but recognition, you know, giving that pat on the back. You know, we always start our, our staff meetings and we do it with uh, whatever our theme of the year. This year it's, you know, space, you know, blasting off into a school year, you know, full of learning. So our award this year is leaving the mark in the classroom, where I award the first one and then after that, whoever receives it passes it on. We have a You Rock Award for, you know, somebody who did something great. Maybe they helped you cover, you know, your recess duty. You know, we have the No Excuses Award for, you know, who's made some big gains in their classroom. We have a Sunshine Award, who's lifting spirits among, you know, uh, in the campus. So having those opportunities for recognition, you know, when we analyze data, don't just recognize those teachers who had the best. Talk, look at, look at for the small growths. Like, hey, you know what? Last time maybe you only had five of your EL students grow. This time you had eight, that's growth. You know, making sure that we're recognizing the little gains, not just with our students, but with our teachers too, because we all need a pat in the back. You know, sometimes I have to pat myself in the back too, because I'm like, I want some recognition as well. But you know, I think we're all human and we need that recognition, so we need to remember that. And as principals also, we need to be able to um, advocate for our teachers. I know in the last couple of years, our district has said, okay, ELD benchmarks, you know, writing benchmarks. You know, and I've had to, you know, have a little conversation with my superintendent and say, you know what, what we're doing is working. The data shows are working. Do we really have to do this? And it's like, okay, but just don't tell the other schools that we're doing this. <laughs> so don't be afraid to advocate for them because like I said, you know, they appreciate it in the long run. And it's like I said, you know, you have, you have to have their back because they definitely have my back. What advice would you give to other schools about how to start their own pathways to change? Well, you have to be courageous. You know, if you want to change your school, you have to be courageous. You have to be bold. You have to be swift. You have to just catch that moment. You know, everything is about timing. Nobody else is going to solve it for you. Don't be part of the problem. Just be part of the solution. Um, as th I think for principals, they need to unleash the uh, early adopters, you know, the, uh, the, the people who have, uh, let's face it, education is not, uh, we're not chiseling textbooks, we're not chiseling textbooks on rocks anymore, we're moving forward. So you need somebody who is innovating your vision, your philosophy for your school. It's, it's a living organism. So you have to, not, whatever worked today, this year for us, is not gonna work next year, trust me. You know, the world is changing and it's changing really fast, you know? I think that um, uh, you have to have a purpose, you know? You have to have a vision, you know? You, ha you have to know that we need uh, innovation, we need innovators, we need to instill that in our kids. Today, uh, what's that, uh, Twitter? You know, IPO, it's out there. 
We are the valley of innovation. So why are we teaching our kids cursive? You got to write in cursive. You better do it right. I don't, I don't know. I'm very, very, you know, I'm not very adamant about teaching cursive. But I, I think that <laughs> what I'm, I'm trying to illustrate a case here. You know, we have to sometimes, you know, y of course the future is unpredictable, but you, there is a tendency. There is a trend. There is, you know where we're going. And, uh, you know, competition is all over the place now. We are not the only, the only players in the world anymore. There's people who are coming after us, after this spot, you know, the first place on everything. Um, so have purpose, you know. What do you, what do you want these kids to do tomorrow? Um, well, when I said earlier, you know, teachers, we have talents. You have to match those talents to your school's needs. That's what you have to do. Uh, very easy, to s very easy to say, but I don't know. Um, I think at your school, you have to find the one unifying element. What is it, what is, what is that element that brings everyone together? The one thing that everyone is gonna compromise on. We don't agree with everything, right? But whatever decision that you come up with, you have to make sure everyone survives. They don't just say, oh, I'm gonna live with it. No, you're actually gonna survive and you're gonna do it well. It is for the sake of the team. So you need to find that one element. At our school, it was an element that I particularly didn't like, but I took it. It was win, what I need. It was you know, preparing the students around the standards and all of that. I didn't quite believe on about that, but I did. And I did make sure that I wasn't the one who was dragging my school behind. I knew I, was, I needed to be accountable. And I did make sure that my kids performed at the top of my school. Right? It sounds a little arrogant, but uh, I don't know. People don't mind when uh, LeBron, John, uh, LeBron, <laughs> LeBron James uh, is arrogant, and they probably mind when teachers are a bit, a bit, a bit arrogant. I don't mind that. Um, <coughs> so we need to make sure that um, we compromise. Find that one element that you compromise, and then uh, you can bring teachers together, and they, work, they can work as a team. My advice would be to let um, data do the talking, that's the first step. Um, I think we spend a great deal of time just um, looking at student data to guide our learning. Um, looking at data intensively will help um, us determine what to teach, what interventions are needed, and how should collabor collaboration time be used. And when using data, student data with precision, it will just focus on their academic needs and use um, data consistently to drive our instruction. I think our number one focus is having high expectations for everyone expectations for the students, for the teachers, for the parents, for classified. It's, it's knowing that our number one customers are the kids. And if we don't give them that full focus, I mean, we're shortchanging them. We're teaching our kids right now in elementary, jobs that haven't even been created will be coming their way. And how are we preparing them? I mean, so we have to be ready to move, like, or gentleman here said, with technology, it's going fast. I mean, you know, I still remember when we had a VCR and it had a remote control with the wire cable to the VCR. <laughs> you know, that's what I grew up with. You know, I told my son the other day, like, oh, you know, he's a third grader. I said, oh, make sure that um, don't move my album. And he looked at me like, what's an album? That's for pictures, mom. <laughs> you know, I think that's what we have. So we can't be, you know, afraid of change we need to be ready we need to move forward and you know i see everybody with their phones and in their you know their pads and everything that's our kids that's where they're at so i have a book i have a whiteboard i have a smart board i better know how to use it to keep their attention to me that's what we do there are so many um so many pieces of advice that you know uh, gabby and i were discussing uh prior to coming up here um, but like the gentleman said, uh, you have to be courageous um, 
uh, and administrators, to all the administrators out there, allow teachers a voice in staff development needs. Um, and teachers, when you're given that voice, be courageous and tell the administrators what exactly you need. Um, because if you don't ask, you won't get. Most importantly is to allow time to collaborate. And uh, with the funds that we've had in our school, we have had that time, and that's what we started with. Uh, when we first started um, um, our, our QEIA funds, we started with um, allowing time for collaboration. Uh, we um, allowed room for flexibility in our schedule. You know, if we set a schedule, it wasn't um, always kept to that. There was always room for flexibility. Um, and just ask for what you need and be courageous like uh, we're all talking about here and uh, keeping students in mind, using your data to drive your instruction and just remember who we're really looking out for is our future. You know, we're not in the classroom where all the magic happens but if I can do whatever I can to support Gloria or to support any classroom teacher, that's what's needed because the end result is she's gonna be helping the students in her classroom. So I think that's, that has to be one of the key roles. But you know, flexibility too. Because I know, you know I have my mandates that I'm having, but like I said, if I see that you know, when teachers come to me, you know, we have a problem, okay? So what have you guys thought about? Well, we think if we do this and this and this, listen. Because like I said, I mean, we used to have you know, school-wide, ELD, everything was at the same time. Guided reason, everything was at the same time. But as teachers notice, you know what, we can, we can um, be more effective if we do it at this time and at this time. So I said, okay, let's shift it. You know, so being flexible and really listening to those voices, um, being supportive in resources. You know, if they need technology, if they need to go to conferences, if they need um, instructional materials. And like I said, recognizing them, don't be afraid of data. And if they are afraid of data, then make the data friendly, you know. If, if sometimes when teachers are afraid of something, it's because they don't understand. So provide that, you know, whether it's that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, instruction, or, or maybe you know, mentoring them up or partnering up, up with a with a different colleague that will help. Um, focusing on one or two things, you know, nobody wants to be that, you know, chasing all these rabbits in the dark. But if you focus on one or two things and really refine them, you know, when we started off, we said our focus was ELD and writing. Well, guess what? ELD and writing are still our focus areas. And every year we've tweaked it a little bit more and we have seen our scores get better and our students are better writers and our ELD students have really, really grown. And it's because every year we've refined our process. And like I said, you know, analyze, you know, give teachers that opportunity at the end of the year to analyze the school year. You know, we always do at the end of the year we do a pits and cherries. You know, what were all the great things? What were not the great things? Okay, and I use that, and you know, and sometimes I hear them like, oh, but that's what's helping me. And if I really want to have that relationship with my teachers, I need to be able to take it, you know, put my, my big girl pants on and say, okay, they didn't like that, how can I change it? In some cases I can't, in some cases I can, and, and that's what I need to do. So that's the advice we'd give to any new school. When we started having meetings seven years ago, six years ago, I remember saying to people, if your school looks the same in seven years, seven years from now as it does right now, even if you've met all your accountability requirements, you will not have fulfilled the promise of QEIA. And what is so heartening is hearing how much the promise of this program that started out seven years ago has actually been fulfilled by all of you. It's, uh, it's just, I am awe-inspired, literally.